Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And Frank from Tested. And today, I know you've been waiting for this video, we're gonna watch paint, Frank paint your creaky fig. Yeah, why not? Yeah, so we're using the internet time machine again because you guys by now have already seen Frank hopefully successfully walk through Comic-Con. Probably pretty sweaty. Pretty sweaty, you didn't die this time. No, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully, And but this is how this creature, this mask, came out of the mold. Yeah, this is a raw, unpainted casting uh, that Immortal ran for me. Um, you can see it doesn't even have the eye forms in there. So let's uh, let's see how I can mess it up with some paint. All right, let's get to it. All right, Frank. As you start on painting this, uh, what do you use to paint silicone? Uh, you know. The only thing that really sticks to silicone is silicone, so you need to use a silicone-based paint. Um, there's a bunch of different things that you can get, like there's uh, Smooth-On has a thing called Psycho Paint, which is basically a catalyzed, you know, part A and part B, and then you thin that down and mix some silicone pigments in it. Um, and then there's other ways where you could use silicone caulking and thin that down, and that's that's what I'm using. I'm using um, Smooth-On Silpoxy, uh, kind of because it. It sets up really fast. Um, I'm, I'm kind of lazy, so I want it to just like, I want to mix it and paint it and let it set real quick so I can fiddle with it. Um, if you use other slower silicones, it, you know, it takes overnight before it like really grabs. But you know, if I do it this way, I could do a whole layer of paint, then go to lunch, then come back, and then I can do like washes and stuff like that because the first layer is already set. Um, so I just happen to, to like doing this. So I put a bunch of, Silpoxy into a little mason jar with some Novox thinner. You can also use like toluene or xylene or any of those other crazy, not good for you chemicals. Uh, naphtha works really well if you can get it. We can't really get it much here in California. Um, but I use Novox, it works just fine. Um, and uh, and then shake it up. You're, you're mixing right now, you're no, you don't have any pigments in there. Yeah, this is just like when I painted the, the latex mask a little while ago. I make a, a, a jar with some base in it, and then I'll pour off little bits and add, uh, add my pigment to that. I is there a working time to that base? Yeah, this, is, this one's probably gonna give me mm, half an hour, 45 minutes before this stuff starts gelling and, and getting a little hard to work with. Um, so I only mix small batches at a time. I don't mix like a big jar. Um, you know, if you use a slower setting, caulking, you can use a big jar. Um, so with silicone, like this is a pretty fresh mask, like I could go in and use the AB catalyzed paint and it would be great. Um, but uh, with most silicone stuff, you know, you could, like there's stuff I have sitting on a shelf for a couple of years, I could come in and I could paint with the caulking. You can't do that necessarily with the catalyzed stuff. It doesn't want to stick as well, it'll delaminate. Um, but one thing that kind of helps is if you kind of give it a rinse down of this thinner. So I'm just gonna take my airbrush or take a chip brush and I'm just gonna kind of wet the whole surface down with just thinner. And what that does is that makes the silicone swell up a little bit and it, um, it kind of opens the pores, so to say, of the molecules and lets, lets your paint grab onto the silicone a little bit better. Um, you know, sometimes you, you paint with caulking or paint with catalyzed stuff and, and it just rubs off. None of these solvents, none of these paints, like none of the stuff is good for you at all. Um, I'm, wearing, I'm wearing gloves, but these solvents will soak through the gloves pretty quick. Um, you know, I'm flicking around a lot of paint. Probably should wear some safety glasses. Um, and then, you know, I should be wearing a respirator doing this, but it'd be kind of hard for me to talk over, over working on stuff. So um, if you do this at home, use a respirator. Uh, you know, I have a pretty big shop here, a lot of airflow. Um, you can could, you could hear the fan in the background. It's sucking it in from one side of the shop and blowing it out the other. So I have a, I have a good, you know, circulating airflow in here right now. So I'll live, but like I said, none of this stuff's particularly good for you. So you should be using a respirator and all the necessary safety gear. Because safety never takes a vacation. All right, Frank, let's start talking about your process here. You're using an airbrush this time. Yeah, um, you know, like 
like usual, I, I kind of bounce back and forth between hand painting and airbrushing. Um, but these first couple passes are going to be airbrushed, and I'm going to kind of time it out so that I get a couple of airbrush passes, and then and then I'll go to lunch, and then when I come back, these airbrush layers will be set, and then I can do some hand brushing without disturbing the uh, the airbrush stuff. You know, that's that's part of the. Um, the charm of using this silicone that sets kind of quick. Um, you know, I can I can move on to my le next layer without disturbing the previous layers. Right. So, are you taking the consideration that you are using the the kind of translucent silicone um, that uh, as a base? Does that inform how what you start out with? Um, not really. It just it depends. Like, you know, when I paint things that are naturally opaque, I usually end up starting out with a bunch of washes to kind of give it a false translucency. Um, but because this is so translucent, I want to build up my colors like even slower than normal to kind of, to kind of aid in some of that translucent feel. Um, and I, I don't want things to get opaque too quick because um, that, could, that could go bad kind of fast if I, do it, if I, if I go too quickly with a color. Um, you know, and I, I have a couple of airbrushes sitting here. Right now I'm just using kind of like my, my go-to uh, Iwata Revolution, but I also have a, um, like a custom Eclipse, or a custom CS or something or other, and a, and a TH, which is like kind of the big one. So I'll kind of I'll use the TH for big wider passes, but for all this like little kind of noodly stuff, you know, need a, a big giant airbrush or something with a big cup or anything. It's just kind of, kind of normal airbrush. Can you talk about the pattern that you're going? Because you're not going just blanket coverage. Uh, no. This first pink pigment it almost looks like you're doing some like blood blood work or subsurface. Yeah, it's, you know, if you if you look at your palm, which everybody on the internet is going to look at their palm right now, um, there's, a, there's a breakup of color. Like there's a bunch of these like pale yellows and these reds and blues and there's all kinds of colors in there and you can kind of, I don't know, the easy way to do is just look at your palm and, and if you keep thinking about what that color breakup is, um, that's kind of the pattern that I ended up going, I usually end up going for when I'm trying to paint realistic stuff. Um, you know, skin tones aren't all one color, you know, and, and, and there's colors all over the place. Like I did, you know, one complete pass with that that mauvey pink color, right? You know, first, but you know, typically I try not to do the same treatment all over the head every single time. You know, uh, like right now I'm putting in some real pale blues, and I want to think about where the skin is thinnest, like places like around your eyes, like your eye bags and stuff like that. Um, I keep going back to the corners of his eyes. If you look at the corner of your eye, there's usually a little bit of like this purpley blue. It's, it's, it sits right there by the tear duct. Um, or whatever that, that little spot's called. So, you know, you, you want to mimic the color placement that's naturally in somebody's face. And, you, you know, I've, I've painted so much so often, I, I kind of have a general map of where colors typically go. Um, already in my head, but if, if you don't know it, second nature, you want to, um, you know, you want to have reference. Like there's a lot of books that I usually have around that have these like really great close-up pictures of like celebrities' faces without a lot of makeup on. And you know, if you use that stuff as kind of a, you know, a jumping-off point, I guess, and a, and a guideline for where you're putting color. It, it kind of helps a little bit. You, know, you always want to use reference. Um, you know, again, I, I paint this kind of stuff so often, I, I kind of have a general idea of where things are going to end up going. But um, you know, reference is key. You know, I, people ask, what, what do you recommend? To, you know, learning how to paint, learning how to sculpt, learning how to draw, learning, we'll do whatever. Reference, reference, reference. Um, you know, you can't, you can't talk enough about how that's like the most important thing to have. You know, I mean, when you're replicating, you know, a costume or, you know, a video game character, or something like that, you're using the pictures of their, you know, armor and their weapons and their makeup and everything as reference. 
because you don't know it secondhand. As much as you look at people's faces all day long, every day, like you, you don't know it as well as you really think you do um, until you've really studied the hell out of it. So you want to have reference. You, you know. have sculpted in all those wrinkles. How much do you want to make that pop? Well, you know, everybody's instinct is to go and start drawing in all those lines. But if you think about most people's skin and most people's faces, like there really isn't a whole lot of color difference in, inside of a wrinkle. So if I were to bring it out, it would look unnatural and it would start looking very painterly um, and very fake. So I don't, that's not to say that I won't go in there and punch out a couple of things here and there, but for the most part, I don't want to go in and paint over all you know paint into all these wrinkles because that's just not you know that's not the way it is like you don't have you know shading and color like you know airbrushed in contours in your face like that's just girls that work at the mac counter is that also something you might take into consideration of like how this is going to be viewed like this will be seen in person people are going to be able to get up close to it versus something that might be just for camera yeah stuff for camera i could you know if you were shooting this on film you know, like movie stuff. Um, there's always so much post-production and so many filters put on top of everything. You could paint a little bit impressionistically. And a lot of the times I paint very impressionistically, but because I'm trying to go for like in-person realism, I'm gonna build up these layers and try and paint as natural as I can. So we're back from lunch and you're waiting for the silicone to set. What happens if it's not fully set? Um, well, I put so so little and such like light layers on here. It's not super super like grabbed on yet. Um, you know, the the way I could have made this a little bit stronger is if I would have gone over the whole thing and just like a clear coat layer of you know of paint. That way, there's a mass of of the silicone around to set up. Um, so I just have to be a little bit like careful uh, when I go in with my brushwork. And you know, I want to use a right now. I want to just put these layers of this like really pale flesh and a little bit of a little bit of like cedar browns on there and just kind of gently stipple them on there just to kind of give some like some spotting because if you look if you look at your look at your arms or something like that you know if you, if you have hair in your arms like you have to imagine that there's not or something like find somebody that doesn't have any hair and there's little like little tiny brown spots not necessarily like moles or anything but just like freckling and um, and most people have that so I want to put in this little freckling you know, the cedar brown and a little bit of like this light, light flesh tone, like a rice paper. Is that speckling darker or usually lighter or darker than it's both. the skin tone? Both. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the one is a, is a really light rice paper and another one is, is a, you know, a darker brown. Um, and that just, you know, putting these little like subtle inconsistencies is what's going to kind of help, you know, with the, with the realistic flesh tones. And it's still, you know, it's still real translucent and real kind of waxy looking. So it's, I got to build all that stuff up and kind of, you know, I say it all the time. You got to sneak up on the colors. Right. You can't just go like, you know, hog wild and just throw a bunch of paint on there. As you're sneaking up on it, you're thinking of it in terms of layers still? Like the yeah. first layer of that kind of that, the veiny, the red and purple. Well, and I, don't, I don't necessarily think it of what the layers of skin are. I think it of, think of it more in like, you know, what, what translucent and, and light washes are gonna bring me to something that's a realistic skin tone. Um, you know, and, and having this yellow undertone helps give me that overall, like, yellowness. But, it, it, you know, at the end of it, it's, it's still, it's gonna be brought back to, like, a flesh tone. It's just gonna have this, like, underlying jaundice to it. Um, you know, and then, and then even once I put all this stuff on there, you know, I wanna airbrush, I wanna airbrush kind of a, almost not opaque, but like a, a thicker pigmented, you know, heavier pigmented version of a flesh tone over the whole thing to kind of subdue some of the speckling and, and airbrushiness. And then, you know, and, and still some of these like early stages are gonna come out. And then, you know, and then I'll wrap it up with throwing in some more of these like purpley reds and more of this, this you know, teal blue kind of vein tone-ish kind of thing. So we saw you finish up with that speckling, and is that distribution relatively even throughout, or are you also concentrating in certain parts? No, you know, again with freckles, like you, you, you don't want to do, I mean with any, with just about any layer on this, you don't necessarily want to give the whole thing the same treatment. You want to give it, give the eye somewhere to settle and, and something like that. The whole paint job is just all, 
all a bunch of reds and then that's it, then it's kind of a boring paint job. Or if the whole paint job is the same treatment of breakup all over the whole thing, it's kind of a boring paint job. You know, your skin isn't the same color from your feet to your head. You know, like on the top of your head, you're gonna get a little bit redder because of the sun. On the, you know, on the top of your, bridge of your nose is gonna be redder because you get sun. Um, your, things like your earlobes and, and around your eyes, you know, they're, they're thinner skin, so it's gonna show a lot more reds. Um, you know, you, you just gotta think about where all these colors occur naturally and try and mimic it, not just give the whole thing the same treatment. I've seen some really great makeups, kind, in my mind, kind of ruined because they're just the same treatment of the same, you know, couple of colors the whole way around. And, and you know, there's no, there's nowhere that it stops. It just goes everywhere. I also see you picking up another brush now to kind of put in some darker speckles in very few places around entire head. What are yeah. these supposed to Well this, this goes back to like kind of that like kind of not necessarily moles, not necessarily freckles, but just you know spotting. Like you, you get spots on you. Like especially, imperfections. Yeah, you, you have to have these imperfections and these, you know, and, and I don't want to make it symmetrical. I want to have little little dots here and there where everything kind of, you know, goes play. You know, it's just, you got to give it all imperfections. He's not, isn't that perfect clear skin? He's not, you know, he's not a supermodel. He's a Weird dude. Approaching that uncanny valley we talked about last time yeah. with the sculpting. Now after this, you're doing a full another full layer of airbrushing? Yeah, this is this is that kind of this is kind of an a sort of heavily pigmented layer just to kind of like subdue a lot of the stuff I've been putting on there. You know, all these things build up in layers and you don't necessarily you know you can't fall in love with your details. You have to kinda know when to like kinda push them back a little bit and what to kind of add. And it's just all this, this culmination of all these layers and all these little tiny washes that, that give it like a fleshy kind of look. All right, Frank, that's a paint job. Yeah, you know, like everything that I paint, I may fiddle with it again tomorrow. I still need to, I still need to put like a matte clear coat on this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So once you're, once you're out of here, I'm gonna spray it and it's gonna make a big cloud of dust and put my respirator on, so. Yeah. I mean, like most of your paint jobs, uh, you you said you sneak up on it, yeah. And you know, even watching it in real time, like I couldn't see it transform as starkly as it is right here. Yeah, when you put it next to an unpainted. Oh casting. my god! Yeah, because yeah. you really like you first you see the reds. Like I get that, but then I the whole time I thought I was still seeing that yellow, mm -hmm. and they put it's, it's all gone. Yeah, it looks like flesh. Yeah, but it still has that like jaundicey yellow undertone, and that's mm -hmm. why you you sneak up on it on with these all these little thin washes of paint. All right, uh, let's talk about a little bit of review. Uh, ears, uh, you, you painted those as well? Yeah, I gave a little bit of reds in there because people, you know, their ears have a little bit of redness to them. Mm -hmm. And then this top part, anything on the top of the skull? Um, you know, I just kind of made it feel like there was uh, some sort of bone mass on there. I don't know, I just thrown some colors in there to make it look neat. Yeah, there's definitely trying to go for that anatomy, that uncanny valley. We're calling this, what is this, the creepy fig. Yeah, creepy there fig. Goes. The painted creepy fig, which of course you guys have seen from the future walking at Comic-Con 2016. Thank you so much, Frank. We'll have more projects like this, more things, cool. dream projects in the Let's future. Let's keep doing some crazy stuff. Yeah, definitely. And thank you guys for watching as well. We'll see you next time with more projects on Tested. Bye.